So, welcome guys, welcome everybody to our uh, monthly journal club. I'm Thanos Vostanis. For those of you who do not know me, I'm a lecturer here at the Tizar Center at the University of Kent. And we have two ABAI verified core sequences uh, teaching positive behavior support and applied behavior analysis to our postgraduate uh, students. Now, the Tizar Center uh, focuses on individuals with intellectual and other developmental disabilities. And as part of our work, we organize different journal clubs. One is the autism one focused on autistic individuals needs. We have the Behavior Analysis Journal Club, and we also have the TZART seminars, which are focused more uh, broadly around uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. For this journal club, we offer one free CEU, or if you're collecting CPD, we can offer you a certificate for that as well. And I'm going to talk to you in a moment about how to go about collecting your CEUs. Now, the TZART also has, um, along with our courses, we have a uh, journal, a peer review journal called the Tizard Learning Disability Review, and we welcome uh, submissions uh, that include any type of case studies that you might do in your clinical practice, or if you have even more robust research that uh, you would like to publish with us. Our request is that it has a, an applied focus and you include individuals with, who have learning disabilities. So if you meet those two criteria, you would be more than welcome to submit your work with us and we would be very keen to uh, publish it. Now, regarding your CEUs, I'm going to say three keywords today throughout the presentation. Just make a note of them. And then at the end, what I would like you to do is you pop me an email where you have your full name as you want it on the certificate, the three keywords and your BACB certification number. Now, just remember, don't put your account number on, uh, in, in the, on the email, put your certification number. It's a different uh, one. I'm going to put my email on the chat so you guys have it. But I'm going to do that as well at the end, just in case uh, anybody misses it. OK, so today I am very, very excited to welcome Jonathan Amy, who is a very experienced and a very knowledgeable precision teacher. Now, if you have heard or seen Jonathan present, you know that he's going to drop bombs. I strongly recommend you have your notebooks in front of you. I was just telling him that <laughs> every time he he presents, I kind of hate his guts because I, I get a, like my wrist gets cramped from all the writing I'm doing because he's just the, the, the information is is constant and the and it's so exciting to hear about his work that you cannot stop uh, your note taking. So be, be ready to make a lot of notes today. He's going to be talking about motor skills. He's probably one of the most knowledgeable people uh, in this area. So uh, you're going to learn from one of the best. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for coming today and uh, thank you very much for um, uh, giving us the opportunity to learn from you. Uh, I've, as I said, um, and those who are regulars know that I, I typically say if you would like to share with us what you're currently working on so that we get an idea of what is cutting edge in, uh, in the world of motor skills and precision teaching, and then you can take it away. I'll be keeping track of the chat, and if there is anything, uh, any questions or anything I need to comment on, I'll just draw your attention to it. Other than that, I will only uh, interrupt you for the uh, CEUs. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Thanos. That was a that was a terrific introduction. I, uh, it's quite a lot. Um, you know, I just really enjoy doing motor. Uh, and so my background is in athletic training and special education. So my love for this stuff is, has been going on for quite some time. Uh, so please, if you have questions as we go through it, I'm going to try and get through as much information as I can. Uh, I want to give you as much as possible. Um, so please put questions in the chat box and I'll get to them. Uh, if we don't get through everything in the time that we have, uh, I'll get to them eventually. You can email them to me. I'll have my email at the end. So I don't want any questions to go unanswered. Uh, and here we go. Uh, this, this presentation is, is influenced by this article uh, about the effects of the fluent levels of big six and, and plus six skill elements on motor skills. And so we're going to do a deeper dive. This one looks- Jonathan, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but yeah. um, we can see the team's uh, window Oh, okay. over the slide, so Got if it. you could minimize it, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. All right, 
Um, so this is based on on this article, and ultimately this is looking at fine motor skills, and it's it's much bigger than the fine motor skills, right? They allude to the article in the article about looking specifically at like gross motor and hip movements. That's the piece that we're going to really be going over today, the, the aspect of a component composite analysis. Now, I'd like to give a thank you to these following wonderful individuals who made all of this work possible. Of course, this is all based on B.F. Skinner uh, and the work of Ognar Lindsley Jr. Uh, Eric and Elizabeth Houghton contributed immensely to this. Uh, Carl Binder, the staff of the Merrimack Education Center in 1980, uh, Mary Kovacs, and Bill Housel. So a lot of the work that you're going to see today is based on uh, the work that was done before. I want to make a big note about the big heart. Ultra important when we, when we start looking at motor, we want to honor and respect our learners. We want to adhere to data, and we ultimately want to have a love of the chart. One of the quotes that I think really kind of speaks to precision teaching is that only those who have the patience to do simple things fluently will acquire the skills to do difficult things easily. This is important because we're going to be looking at fluency. And although you can do a lot of these motor skills in the absence of the chart, the chart will magnify and really make these things special. So component composite analysis. If we look at a composite skill as something like taking a shower, it's based on a, a bunch of different components. So let's start breaking that down a little bit. Let's look at the component skills of taking a shower. We need to do things like washing our hair, drying off, applying soap to a washcloth. Now, if we look at just there, like that could be somewhat of a task analysis in a way, but what are the things that we need to be able to do to make washing the hair, drying off and applying the soap to the washcloth actually something we could do? They're called tool skills. We need to be able to raise our arm over our head. We need to be able to lift our leg. We need to be able to squeeze. This is the world we're gonna live in right now during this presentation, in these tool skills. Let's look at a couple other ones, something like playing the piano. If that's our composite, playing card, uh, playing the chords might be considered a component, and tapping the key would be our tool skill. Washing dishes is a composite, scrubbing the dishes off would be the component, and grasping the sponge is one of our tools. If getting dressed is our composite, putting on shirt can be a component, and buttoning can be a tool skill. Now, these aren't set in stone, they can be fluid. So depending on what the goals are with your learner, that's gonna determine where in this component composite analysis you're gonna be. I can, take the, I can take scrubbing the dish as my composite skill. Grasping the sponge might be the component. And just being able to pick it up might be a tool skill. So let's see how this differs slightly from a task analysis. If I look at the task analysis and I see these are the step-by-steps -step needed, turning on the right faucet, the left faucet, placing my hands under the water. This is the bread and butter for a lot of applied behavior analysis. We can do these things very well, but what happens whenever my learner starts having barriers to progress here? That's when I might start looking at the tool skills. For instance, turning on the right faucet, you need to be able to reach. You need to be able to grasp. You need to be able to turn. Those tool skills are going to influence the ability to do the right faucet, turning it on. Dispensing soap. If I need to pump the soap dispenser, if I need to put my hands under the water, I need to bring in the midline. I need to be able to pronate and supinate my arms in order to be able to wash my hands off. So that's the lens I want you to start really looking at everything with today. And that's what they alluded to in the article whenever they were talking about the ability to do the tool skills related to the larger composite task. Eric Cotton first observed this, that when critical component skills are disfluent, meaning they're unable to be performed at appropriate rates, they will impose ceilings on the development of the composite skills. Solstein and McManus later found that when critical component skills develop to adequate rates through practice and instruction, now the composite skills are capable of being acquired and performed. Solstein and McManus worked a lot in vocational settings. So they were looking at tool skills for adults and older learners. And Eric was looking at tool skills for learners in a school setting. Now it's really important that I'm gonna give you enough information that hopefully it will build a lens for which to, to view some of these things. And 
Ascent is a huge piece that must be taken into account. And all programs must only be done with the learner's full ascent. That means they are willing participants throughout all of the instruction that we're doing. And they can withdraw it at any time. And when they do, the program must stop. And ultimately, it is the responsibility of the instructor to know your learner and recognize when ascent has been withdrawn. So when we look at the things that we're teaching commonly, and we're trying to do these composite component analyses, we look at things like leisure skills, swimming maybe. We look at navigating our environment, walking. And then we have this thing down at the bottom, right? This school cafeteria. And as a special education teacher, this is where I was most concerned. Because when I'm looking at the learners in special ed rooms, typically when are they eating lunch? either before all the kids get there or after the kids get there, right? They're never really included. And it's for a variety of reasons. And, you know, I've heard teachers say, oh, it's because it's too loud, it's too noisy, it's too bright. There's all kinds of sensitivity. But if we look at what all of these learners are doing, right, all of these kids, what, can you see some of the motor movements? If we're going to apply that component composite analysis, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm circling these girls in the bottom right turning their heads, looking at the teacher, right? How about these boys here balancing trays, looking at where they're gonna sit? These kids in line that are sidestepping with a tray, getting their food. How about pulling out a chair and sitting down? Those are the types of things that we really wanna look at. And this is what I am putting a program together for for most of my students. Do they have the skills necessary to be included in this setting with their peers. And just take a second to kind of look around and see all this stuff, right? There are a ton of motor movements going on. And if you're just fluent, then all of a sudden, lights may be distracting, sounds may be distracting, there's not enough stimulus control. Okay, so keep that in mind as we move through this. I'm just going to give you a couple more examples of a component composite analysis just as a way to kind of bring it together with the article. If we look at things like brushing teeth, just act it out yourself and look at all of the motor things you have to do to pick up the toothbrush, to move it around your mouth. It involves your wrist, your fingers, your elbow, your lips, your tongue, your jaw, and of course breathing, your diaphragm's a muscle. Rules. That's the cognitive stuff, right? Like the amount of time, the rinsing procedures, how you clean up, the physics of it, how much force you need to apply. Using a winter coat, things we're commonly asked to teach. Taking on and off a hook, using your shoulder, your wrist, your elbow, your fingers, everything that you need for zippering. And then we look at something like stocking the grocery store shelves. I love this picture because it kind of puts it all together. When you look at the neck, the shoulder, the wrist, the fingers, the elbow. And you figure like, wow, I got to put a bag of noodles on the shelf versus a jar of spaghetti sauce versus a carton of eggs. All very different amounts of force, which is a whole other part of motor that we need to think about. It's hard to regulate the amount of force you do. Think little kids. What are they always doing? Spilling things, right? It's really hard to be able to turn be able to pronate and supinate, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, without letting all that liquid come out of the container. Or just coloring in the lines. It's hard to slow down your wrist and fingers as you get to the edge of something. Okay, so how is this influence? How are we teaching it? Well, a couple of things inform this. The team and Markle Taxonomy for Learning, outcome, uh, learning Outcomes, the Early Body Fluency Learning Outcomes, and the Merrimack Education Collaborative. So if we look at team and Markle, I know how familiar you are with all of this. Uh, it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but I just wanted to bring it up for those that do. Um, we're going to be in the single responses and chains area of the psychomotor column. Team and Markle uh, suggest that muscular movements are under deliberate control and that good coordination and timing require the brain to initiate a smooth sequence of nerve impulses, which fire the muscle cells the right order at the right time. And otherwise, it looks really good right? It looks like you know what you're doing. A lot of times we see learners that we say, oh, well, they got good motor skills, but they really don't. It's kind of jagged, right? It looks disfluent. It doesn't look coordinated. 
even though they are moving their bodies. We want it to be smooth. The other big thing about psychomotor is it's never learned by talking or seeing, it's only learned by doing. And the big piece that Tim and Markle said that practice should consist of many repetitions. And of course, this is what precision teaching is great at, is providing those repetitions in an efficient way, in a database efficient way. But ultimately what we're trying to do is to shift a learner to the relevant kinesthetic feedback of moving. If you've ever done something and it like felt good and you're like, yeah, I know I did that really good, right? You felt it in your muscles. That's what we're trying to do. So we're gonna look at the large muscle groups first. We're gonna be looking at the shoulder, the lumbar, the torso, and the hip. A gross to fine motor progression will typically start the gross motor movements first. So the article focuses on the fingers and alludes to the fact that we need to be looking at more gross motor skills. Well, it's because the gross motor skills inform what goes down the line. And so if you're disfluent at your fine motor, start looking up. So for example, if your learners are struggling with fine motor at the finger movement, look at the wrist. If the wrist is weak, look at the forearm. If the forearm is weak, look at the elbow and the shoulder. So gross motor is imperative to develop the fine motor skills. So we're teaching on the chart and Kovacs identified a prompting sequence that she used uh, in 77 that revolves around this full guide. They allude to it in the article as something called maxi guiding. We typically don't do maxi guiding with uh, motor skills. Lindsley defined maxi guiding as going well over the natural aim. So you'd be going like twice as fast, three times as fast as what you'd need to be able to do. We're not gonna do that with these gross motor movements. We're gonna just do simple touch do, which would be full prompting. And it's technically, I'd like to call it a prime because a prompt, we're not adding any additional stimuli. We're not giving anything that's gonna, they have to attend to a vocal or you know, some sort of visual stimulus, we're simply moving them through the range of motion. Just like a baseball coach or a softball coach would get behind the learner and help them swing a bat, right? So we can think of examples where people help us with movements just to kind of show us, just to kind of get us in the right position. That's what we're talking about here. And then we'll usually fade that systematically to like a nudge or a light guide. The see do and the hear do are what would be prompts where we're adding additional stimuli. Like a see do would be where they're imitating me doing the movement or a hear do where I'm telling them to do each individual movement one at a time. And then finally, the free do is that they're completely able to do it on their own with no additional input. We chart everything, even these full guides. And importantly, when we first start, we do everything bilaterally, meaning we're gonna use both sides of the body at the same time. And then we'll move to unilateral, we'll isolate one side and then go to cross lateral. Now we do this in a variety of situations. We can do all these movements sitting down, standing up and laying down. So you don't have to be limited by, by your materials around you. And ultimately we're gonna meet the learner where they're at. We're always going to utilize their strengths. So we're not going to force them into any situation that they can't do or are struggling to do. We're always going to capitalize on what are they currently doing, even if it's not the full range of motion, and start there. It's very constructional that way. All right. Can so, I just jump in to deliver the first keyword? Yep. The first keyword is shoulder. The first keyword is shoulder. All right, so the shoulder base motions revolve around flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. You can see them here. And is everything moving okay, Thanos? Can you see it? It's all good, yes. Awesome. Okay, so uh, the first motion is flexion. So if you're, you're sitting at home, <laughs> raise your arm up over your head in a straight line, that's flexion. Uh, bringing it behind you is extension. Doing what would be like the top part of a jumping jack almost would be an abduction. And then adduction would be crossing that midline. You can see how these would be important for so many things that you do throughout your day. The mastery guides are on the bottom. This is the general aims that we tend to want to get our learners to. They're not written in concrete, right? These are not, you, we all ultimately have to get to 60. You absolutely must get to 85. No, we're not going to have learners struggle to get to these aims if they're not able to. 
Uh, so if you are a precision teacher and you do have learners that you're saying, hey, I could probably do some of these with my learners and they're only at like 20 per minute and that's kind of where they're at, no problem, especially if they're little guys. But these are the general aims for normative mastery. There's other motions that we do too that are really important, like elevation, which is like a, just a shoulder shrug. The internal and external rotation are one of the hardest movements for a lot of learners to do. External rotation, you can see how important that would be for putting on a seat belt, right? And then rotation, just being able to draw circles. So I'm going to show you some videos of what some of these things look like. Two second timing, and our goal is eight and ten seconds. When you're ready, please begin. Good, Finn. Keep going. Good. Job, Good. Bye. So this is just an example of bilateral shoulder flexion. Now you can see that he has a little bit of endurance problems, right? He started off looking really nice with the motion. And as it went through the timing, the performance degraded further and further until his arms were completely bent, right? So this is something that he definitely needs to work on, right? Now, just getting back to where we want to meet the learner where they're at, this learner could not do the full range of motion. So we just cut it in half. Leandro, we're going to start shoulder flexion. Try to get to 19. Ready? Ready? Go. Good. 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 Good.
at around uh, 5th December, he moved to an independent or 3rd December, he moved to an independent. Uh, the point dropped, but then he climbed steadily and we were able to move through the timing floors once again. Elbow and forearm. So the elbow can only move in one way, it's flexion, and it's just your basic bicep curl. Mastery guide is 80 to 65. Now this one, the next one is really important. It's called pronation and supination. And Brad has his arm up just so we can see it, but it's most often used in pouring. And what the critical feature is, is that the elbow is bent, right? So your elbow is bent and you're twisting your arm up and down. You can see how important that is, once again, for the pouring. And there's something that's that's kind of funny with motor movements is it's called an eccentric contraction. And it's, it's as you rotate through or you're slowing your muscle down kind of while stretching it, it's really difficult to do that. <laughs> once again, that's why little kids spill things and, and color outside the lines. So we practice that quite a bit to get the pouring aspect. Here's how bilateral elbow flexion can look on a timing. Once again, I apologize for the sound, but the instructor is simply giving him an expectation beforehand uh, where they're telling him how long he's going for and what he has to do. Uh, you can see a little bit of rocking there with the back, a little bit of kind of nudging forward with the neck, but we're not gonna make a big deal out of that. We're just gonna gradually shape it up as it goes. Down, now, as we move, oh, that one had sound back. So once we got up the bilateral, we moved to unilateral. And he actually has some hand weights that he's doing here. Seven. <laughs> okay. So that moves us to the wrist. And the wrist is obviously very important for handwriting, but for navigating so many ADLs. And we look at extension and flexion. Extension is simply bringing your wrist up. Flexion is bringing your wrist down. And ulnar and radi uh, radial deviation are, are so named for the bones that's on that side. With ulnar, you're moving your whole wrist towards your pinky, and radial, you're moving your whole hand towards your thumb. You'll know kids are weak here because they'll be using their whole arm, or they'll be bending at the elbow. So we have to isolate just that part of their wrist. And here's how we did it with this learner. hang it off the edge of the table. Once again, nothing fancy. All we need for all of this is a timer and a chart and a pencil. Down and up, down and up. Okay, ready? 10 seconds and begin. One, two. Three. Now this instructor combined flexion and extension Five, together. I should say the instructor is actually seven, his mom eight, um, with no nine, prior ten. experience in anything other than being his mom. And she learned all of this quite easily owner and radial deviation. I'm going to turn the sound off on this one because they were doing something called a stability check in precision teaching where we provide a number of competing stimuli and make sure that the performance can withstand that. So it's a little bit noisy. But in this case, he's just doing the owner deviation moving towards the pinky side and she's helped stabilizing his forearm a little bit. All right, so I know there's probably lots of questions by now, <laughs> but uh, please, once again, I'll make sure I get to all of them at some point. Uh, the big six plus six that are mentioned in the article, uh, originally identified by Eric Hutton and Annie Desjardins, uh, they looked at reach, point, touch, grasp, place, release, push, pull, tap, shake, squeeze, turn, and pinch. Here's what some of them look like. Now, as we've just kind of seen, these are comprised of the other skills we just talked about, right? Like the shake is really just radial and owner deviation. Hopefully you guys can have a good sense of this if you haven't already done some of the big six, but just how important these motions are. Here's how we combine them together in something we call reach, grasp, place, release. You can see how quick all of these programs are. They don't take long to do. They're only a couple of seconds, but they have massive results. So it's called reach because obviously he's reaching for the, the marbles, he's grasping them, 
He's placing them over the cup, and then he's releasing them into the cup. So as you watch it, I'm going to play it again. As you watch it, try to think about what major skill this makes up. What's a major academic skill that all of us do that looks very similar to this? And if you said handwriting, you win, right? So you have to be able to pick up your pencil, you have to put it down on the line, you have to go across midline, you have to pick it up, you have to return back to the other side and place it back down again. This is how we meet the learner where they're at. This learner doesn't have that nice pinch yet. You can just kind of see the kind of grasp that he has. We're using materials that are easier for him to pick up. And the distance that he has to move it isn't as far. You can also see, just see how happy he is doing it. All right, so that's the general idea, okay? Always meet the learner where they're at. This is an example of reach, which they talk about in the article as well. They're simply giving high fives as the instructor moves their hand through space in front of the learner. It's not imperative that they make contact, but doing high fives is always lots of fun. Once we put them together, now we have something called reach point. And in this, the, the instructor is gonna be moving a laser dot on the table anywhere within his range of motion, and he needs to be able to touch it right on the point. Now, if you're running a, a traditional ABA program where you have multiple stimuli on the table, of course, you'd see how important this is for like a hear point or receptive identification program. Obviously, if they have a weak reach and a weak point, that's gonna influence how they do that program. And you might get resistance in programs like that if they have weak motor skills. Here's how we do it on the chart. The little M indicates the mastery guide. It's interchangeable with the, the A that you typically see on charts. We split the chart once again on the left and right side. You can see the acceleration up, moving through the timing floors quickly. There's our traditional endurance check and stability check, also mentioned in the, in the article as REAPS. There's a retention check that occurs. Um, they do it within a week uh, for the purposes of the study, but we typically do it four weeks out. And then the A is an application check, meaning they should be able to do it with multiple instructors, with multiple stimuli as well. So always thinking about how does this stuff inform what the learner needs to do in their home? Similar to what you saw Terry doing with the CAN, now he's combining the shoulder flexion and the RGPR together in order to be able to manipulate things on the shelf. Jonathan, yes. quick question. So do yes. you start with 10 second timings and then increase the duration of the timings? Yes. So we're going to meet the learner where they're at. And so some learners will need a six second timing floor. Uh, it's not labeled on the chart proper, but we can, you know, using the chart, we can create any timing floor we like. So some learners, we will start at six seconds. And then when I get to the torso, I'll show you how we do repetition timings before um, a countdown timing. So when we think traditional academics, uh, we do something called SAF meds or even just in a regular classrooms, we have just flashcards, right? Well, if a, you know, if your learner can't manipulate the cards, well, they're not gonna be able to do flashcards or SAF meds. And so we make sure that they can actually sort the cards appropriately. And so we practice that deliberately. And of course, you need a pinch for both the left and the right hand in order to be able to manipulate the cards. And you need the wrist motions. One family wanted their child to play Uno with them, but he was always resisting. And so if we were to look at, well, what are the tool skills? You can see the baseline with the card sort. Or actually, this was after a couple of weeks of practice. He had pretty nice sort going on there. But now, after we were able to get it fluent, you'll see what he does here. Look how quick that is. He's able to really manipulate all aspects of the cards. So the motor is not a barrier to participation. Okay. This is an example of a popular program in precision teaching created by Elizabeth Houghton called sentence segmenting. And in this case, the learner is expected is expected to listen to a sentence um, and, whoops, sorry about that. 
listen to a sentence and be able to segment it into its words. Listen to mom first and then you move the blocks and say, ready? Where are you? Samuel came in. So you can Welcome see the motor down. movements that are absolutely necessary to be able to uh, actually like make good benefit nice. of this skill. So if he could not do that push and pull in that slide motion, this would be something he wouldn't be able to work on. So then we do something fun too with attention to task and balancing, okay? I'm gonna fast forward this a little bit just in time. But in this case, the learner is trying to find really the center of gravity for items by placing them on top of different containers. This is about the control. It's about that eccentric muscle contraction we talked about. Now, when you have a learner with like high rate stereotypy, lots of perceptive behavior, don't see any of that here. Attention to task, different types of materials, quickly, fluently, he's got it, right? Um, this chart's out of order, but this is just a pronation supination chart, uh, the one where we're opening up or flipping our hand over. And we can see the MG was for a maxi guide. At this point, we were running a maxi guide, testing it out, and we moved away from it. Um, you can see how fast we were going. And it ended up just being too stressful for both the instructors and uh, the learner. Um, and so you could just kind of see how we moved down. We even put slow down, aim at 40 over here. And then we got to an independent. We have the endurance, the stability, and the retention. Okay, so the hip, very similar to the shoulder, same thing. Flexion forward, extension backward, abduction out to the side, adduction cross midline. We can also do hip flexion sitting down, and we can also do a full rotation. Here's an example of hip flexion with a learner um, where he was pretty much kicked out of every classroom, labeled as highly aggressive, and stunningly labeled as uneducable in a report. Uh, this is a learner also with cerebral palsy, and he's doing just fine. Here's how we were able to do the hip abduction, which is the bottom part of a jumping jack. We simply just used a door frame so that he had the, the whole range of motion and could feel the limits of that range of motion. I'm going to speed it up a little bit. I know it's really fast. I apologize, but... This is Terry again, working at home, trying to get more mobility in his hip. He's using the bottom part of his pull table in order to get that kinesthetic feel or that tactile tag of how far up he can go. I'm gonna skip over this one. This is an example uh, of side steps, that shoulder or the hip ab and adduction. This is the moving the tray along the line in a cafeteria. Now this is a, an instructor a one-to-one, -one, an RBT, if you will, who once included in the team, meaning we were specifically looking at how can she contribute, right? Because RBTs, at least, at least over here in the States, are typically just, they just implement whatever they're told. But when it comes to motor, there's something unique that is happening. The RBTs are learning how to shape behavior in a new and novel way, right? They're not just implementing procedures, they're shaping behavior. They're seeing the learner change in a way that's that minute muscle movement. So they get creative. They start coming up and inventing different programs. And this program was created by the RBT, which I just thought was brilliant. It worked perfectly. So motor has a lot of pluses, not just for the learner, but also for the staff. Uh, and this is hip adduction, just what it would look like on the chart, starting at six seconds and moving through the timing floors with endurance, stability, and retention. Jonathan, just yeah. to say that our second keyword is torso. Our second keyword is torso. That brings us to the torso, the, the most important one, at least in my opinion. So many kids I'm called in on because they're falling out of their chair, they're slumping, they have bad posture. We look at their torso and they're extremely disfluent. So they have weak torsos. So we work on that and then all of a sudden the behavior problems, so to speak, go away. Not that that's the only reason, but we make sure that we address it if it is. 
So torso flexion is simply just being able to bend over between your legs and touch the floor. Always meeting the learner where they're at. If they can't reach the floor, we'll put like a shoe box or a milk crate between their legs with extension. It's just a, it's like a cobra pose in yoga. Lateral flexion is being able to slide your arms down the side of your legs and twist. It's just like the song, doing the twist. I'm going to show you a torso flexion. The one is of a four, but just in the interest of time, here's what it looks like. It's important with torso flexion Four, that they come all, all the way back up, down, down, and that they don't rock, keep going. like with their butt keep off the seat. Keep going. Going up now, this is how we build uh, endurance by starting with repetitions. So for this learner, he could only do five at a time. And we didn't want to put the, the ceiling on of like a timing, like where we said, okay, you're going to go for 10 seconds, give me as many as you can. We just said, let's see how long it takes you to do five. Now, it was taking them like 28 seconds when we first started to do just five. The cool thing about it is that we're only counting the corrects and we're always ending on a correct. So it's reinforced that way. You can see the sharp acceleration till we get to the, to the aim, which is about 30 to 40. Then we added more repetitions. He held it, went to nine repetitions. He held it just fine. That's when we went to the countdown to more formally build endurance. So then when we went to 10 seconds, there was no drop. And we can, we can readily get through the timing floors without issue. So this is one kind of tactic that we'll use to always meet the learner once again, where they're at. Here's how we can put it together. So now we have all of the torso components put together with an RGPR. What's also cool is we're getting some neck motion for free. Now, this learner is enjoying this. It looks like, wow, he's really rocking back and forth. But the learner is doing the extension where he's moving his self back. And then the instructor is pulling him forward to kind of reset him. So this is an alternate way to get extension if your learner doesn't like standing on their or laying on their stomach. Now, this is Terry again. He was having a lot of trouble getting up from a chair. Here's his baseline. So you can see how difficult it was. Wobbly, couldn't even get up. See the concentration. So we're trying to be really constructional here because this was an important piece of what he wanted in his workplace. He wanted to be able to get up from meetings, get up from his work chair. So this is 98 data points later with nine different phase conditions. Here he's just kind of explaining uh, what he had done. So quite a different picture. So we can practice these skills with anything. Now, there was a combination of things we were working on with the hip flexion. You saw them doing those kind of knee raises, touching the pool table. We had done a couple other things as well in addition to this. So this is kind of that composite task that we're looking at and how you work on those tool skills. Please. Just in the interest of time, I'm gonna go through this a little bit quicker. This is our other young man who was doing all the tool skills related to being able to put away his laundry can see how coordinated it looks, right? Like he's just kind of having fun with it. I should have grabbed a baseline, but in a baseline, he wouldn't even attempt it. <laughs> so it wouldn't have been much of a video. He even fixes it. All right. So you get the idea, right? The next step is to teach him how to pick up piles of laundry so that he doesn't do one each one individually. But something really cool here that I had just picked up on is that he uses his knee here to push it in, which we didn't teach him. And I thought that was just a really cool thing that he had done. So I might call that induction. All right, uh, and then the neck, obviously important for social, flexion, extension, uh, lateral flexion and twist. Once again, getting to a lot of those movements that we saw in the cafeteria. Are you ready? Okay. 
So you can see it's not quite fluent yet. You can see the extra motion that he has to do in order to get there, but this is just the start of the program. Okay. She's given a little bit of child tag so that he can feel the range of motion. Flexion is just like the elbow, it's at the knee. It can only move in one way. We call these butt kicks and kids okay, love them. Ready and go. One, two, three. Pretty easy to do. Going four, five, six, but hopefully seven. this is getting your brain thinking about ways that you can implement it with your learners. The ankle is another big one. Um, it, the ankle is so important. I see tons of issues around like playgrounds and transitioning different environments. Because when you look at a playground, there's lots of mulch, at least the ones around here, there's lots of mulch, and kids feel unstable in that type of grounding. Uh, sand is another example. So they'll avoid those situations because their ankle isn't fluent at moving and accommodating all those shifts. So we get the ankle strong, and then all of a sudden, of course, they're able to play on the mulchy playgrounds. But plantar flexion is simply pointing your toes towards the ground, dorsiflexion is bringing it up towards your body. Inversion is moving your whole ankle in line, and eversion is bringing it outward. You can see the very high aims for this. It's just a video of calf raises and how we just calf raises in the core frame. And kind of a little bit of a struggle it is for him, the slight guide that they're giving and using. Okay. Now, with the balance, so you're probably thinking, what is with the balance thing that we are working on? Well, here we simply have him using a utensil and balancing just a desk eraser on it. See, once again, he's pretty happy doing this, but he's learning how to stay in a controlled motion, paying attention to what's in front of him, all for the purposes of something like this. Now he's taking a plate with a full cup, spoon. He's taking it into the kitchen. He's doing it quickly, coordinated. There's no question that he's able to do that fluently. Then he balances it and opens the door. All right, now, this is a baseline of the cafeteria tray. So we've worked on all the tool skills at this point, the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, the fingers. You can see the amount of effort it's taking him. You'll see when he turns around, his thumbs are off the tray, his shoulders are up, he doesn't look happy, he looks stressed. It's taking two instructors just to get him to kind of do it. Now, Pay attention to this one. There's weight on it. It looks more like a traditional cafeteria. He's got a stronger grip. And then right when he turns around is where you'll see it. That's a learner who's proud, right? That's a learner who feels good about doing something for the first time. That's what we're going for. That's it. All right, and then this is the final one. All kinds of stuff on there, a ball, a hand weight. He's got to go up and down steps. He's got to go around obstacles. He's got to stop, turn around, go down the steps, and then put it down. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, I'm going to just, this is just a, a video of a whole bunch of learners doing yoga. I'll show it quickly, um, I know for time. The idea is it's not that yoga is absolutely important. It's just, it's a way of combining all these motions together. And the learner in the classroom is leading the class. This is autistic support classroom, right? So. So we're getting socialization, we're getting imitation. We're getting all kinds of things for free, all just by kind of working on individual motor. One thing about this is that this kid was just going to be a part of the class. The teacher was good. He had asked for So he's doing this all. Up and it goes on for quite some time. You get the idea. And the last thing I want to talk about is some of the oral motor pinpoints. This can be done um, with the mouth as well. And so these are extremely high, but we're looking at the jaw, the tongue, and the lips primarily. Jonathan, yep. Before you move on to the oral motor, we've got yep. a question. Yep. If you've got any ideas about a client who is able to shake his head left 
or right, but cannot do the up and down movement. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So it's we're going to gradually shape it up and meet the learner where they're at. So if that learner can do anything, like if he can just tilt his head down even an inch, that's where we'll start and we'll gradually shape up from there. So we're always thinking about shaping. And if there's if there's something specific to that, you can you can always reach out to me and I can we can look at video together and kind of figure it out. Um, but gradually, it's all about shaping is really what we're kind of looking at. And then since, since because of time, I'll just bring up these last two things is that this can be done with oral motor. Um, we're in the process of doing a lot more in terms of the research with this and, and putting together a full presentation on oral motor. Um, but these are the big eight oral motor movements that we've identified. Um, it's jaw open and close. It's lip closure. Uh, lip, lip closure is just being able to close your lips, not moving your jaw. Uh, lip rounding, just being able to and then lip retraction, bringing them back. Tongue lateralization is moving your tongue side to side in your mouth. Elevation is up, protrusion is out. And then volitional phonation is the ability to make sounds, putting all of these together. All right. So with that, um, we can take questions. So I know we're up against it, but I'll leave the presentation up so we can refer to it if needed. Thank you. That was amazing. I'm not surprised. I knew what I was in for, so I was just enjoying the ride. But for those of you who might have seen Jonathan present for the first time, well, now you know why I invited him. Um, <laughs> Sorry about I've that. Got a, I've got a comment here slash question. You mentioned, uh, thank, um, thank you for the fascinating work. And the question says, you mentioned that motor skills can be a barrier to participation. Have you ever come across children with challenging mealtime behaviors that improve their mealtime participation with some motor skills teaching? Yes, absolutely. And so a lot of it has to do around uh, utensil work. And so if if learners are not wanting to, to be at the, at the table, is it because they don't have the proper posture? They can't manipulate the utensils or the, the cup or whatever it is that's going on specific to that need. But we do a lot of motor around feeding, absolutely. Another question says, would this help someone with MS? With MS, I mean, anything that has to do with constructing behavior, yeah. I mean, I haven't personally worked with anyone with MS, but cerebral palsy for sure. I mean, MS is a degenerative disease. And so it's really, that could be a difficult situation, but doesn't mean it can't be done. And so for, for the elderly right now, what we're doing is we're looking at accelerations where we're not, we're not trying to get accelerations up the chart. We're trying to slow the accelerations, right? And so if you're trying to do a fitness into older age, you have that steady decline. What we're doing is, is slowing that deceleration down in the elderly. So that might be, that would be an interesting research topic. So if you are currently with MS or working with someone with MS, that would be interesting to look at that systematically. Something to follow up on. You've got a uh, Jonathan's email there, heart the chart. So, um... I'm sure he would love to hear from you guys. Any other questions or comments? Any tips for learners that move too quickly and need to slow down? Yes. <laughs> so if you have learners that are moving too quick, that it's about what we'll finally do is we'll differentially reinforce those slower rates. So depending on where they're, if you're just talking about in general, they're like darting around a classroom, they're darting around the clinic, they're very, very active, then it can become, why are they, why are they so active, right? <laughs> What's going on in that situation that's contributing to that? So we'd have to kind of do a little bit of a contingency analysis there to figure that one out. But learners who go and like, you can, you'll see them, we'll be doing shoulder flexions, they'll be just trying to go as fast as they can. And we're like, well, are they going really fast? They just want to be done with this? Or is that what they think they should be doing, right? So then we'll, depending on where that contingency analysis falls, then we'll, we'll shape it up based on that, right? So. Great point, it might be a discrimination issue indeed, good point. Um, I've got a client who has a difficulty with bending knees have you got any suggestions for that? Bending knees. So if it's coming from the knee joint, like those butt kicks that we were showing, that knee flexion, then that's something that we'll work on. So if, if the client will lay, will be able to lay on their stomach, and then we'll see what range of motion do they have there. Can they bring that heel all the way to their back? If they can't, then we'll 
we're going to meet them where they're at, right? So we'll simply use that tactile tag. We'll put our hand at what point they can get to, and we will just gradually move that back. Now, we have some fancy tools called a goniometer that measures like angles of movement. You don't have to go that far. You can just simply just kind of put your hand where they're at and just, hey, they're at like, well, it looks like 10 degrees. Eh, okay, it looks like 20, right? You could draw little pictures, <laughs> take a little snapshot or video. It doesn't have to be complicated. What we're, what's really cool about motor is that it's a, just a beautiful shaping plan, right? It's, the, it's not anything super fancy. And you're always gonna reinforce the learner for their participation and their movement. And that kinesthetic feel, most learners love to move. And once they figure out that their bodies can be coordinated, they'll do it with you, right? They enjoy doing it. It's a big part of what makes the program successful. But yeah, just gradually move them through that range of motion. Another question, are the rates you gave the, the frequency aims, are they specific to an age group? And what do you recommend for a client who might have difficulty understanding the fluency aspect? Yeah, that's normative, it's normative mastery. So when we talk about that, it's like, what do they need to be able to do to function in society, right? So if you kind of look at like, what does it take to be able to cross a crosswalk? Here it's 120 steps a minute. That's kind of what they're timed for around here. So yeah, can you like, can you do it less than 120 steps per minute? Absolutely. But is that gonna be something that can keep up with everybody? Is that where people are gonna be like, oh, okay, now we have to kind of walk really slow. Is that going to preclude them for participation from things? So that's what I'm always looking at. If it is, then I look at adaptive devices and I look at prosthetics. Can I get them to that normative range with something else? Lindsley talks about this beautiful in his prosthesis paper. And so we can kind of look at that specifically to what the needs are and where that learner is going to find themselves. Right. So look at what, what do you want? Where does that learner need to be? Where are they now? And that's going to be your shaping plan if that makes any sense. <laughs> but if you have specific things, just, just email me and we can kind of work through some of that if you want. A final question that I've got here, any advice for someone who refuses to walk? Uh, there is no medical reason, but they, they so they can walk when supported, by they, but they scream. Okay, so then that's the contingency analysis piece, absolutely. If you've ruled out anatomical issues or medical issues, and it's, it's simply like, well, there's no obvious anatomical or medical issue why they shouldn't be able to move. That's always what you'd look at first. But then there's some sort of contingency piece there. And that would be that would be ultra specific. So we'd have to see what it, what what is the reason? What are they getting for? Or what are they getting out of by that happening? What kind of supports are in place that they have to obtain by, by screen? That's a more of a behavior analytic question related to that. Does that make sense? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. But I would, I would refer you to the contingency analysis work um, that Joe Lang has just written a new book about that too, nonlinear contingency analysis, which is really good for that kind of stuff. Um, but I can always help problem solve it too, if you have questions. So this is the book that uh, Jonathan is talking about, nonlinear contingency analysis, going beyond cognition and behavior in clinical practice by mm -hmm. Rootless, the, the publisher. Uh, mm -hmm. And Joe Lang is the first author, guys. Yeah. That's the one, right, Jonathan? Yep, that's it. And that might help pro help you at least get on a path to looking at things like that that might not be so linear in terms of just every time he's picked up. There might be a lot of other things going on there, but but generally that's a really involved thing that might not just be motor based, right? Well, it's it, the Stacy says that it's escape maintained. So um, I suppose it, it it goes back to what Jonathan said. You you, you would need to to work around the function there. And I would work on the whatever motor movements they will do, if it's in a chair, and if they'll just sit there, whatever they'll do in that chair, we're gonna reinforce the heck out of, All right? And if I can build the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, and the finger, and the neck around them just sitting in a chair, that's where I'm gonna start, right? I might get the knee raises. While they're sitting in the chair, there was the one where they were just kind of like lifting their leg off the floor, kind of doing a foot stomp. You could get some, some toy you could put on the floor that made a sound whenever you step on it. And they could, if it's a younger child, if it's an older person, you can use anything that would be fun to kind of step on and stomp, right? And you can get it that way too, and just reinforce that. And then eventually get the torso flexion and build your way up to the fact that what Terry was doing, getting up from the chair. So now they're just lunging up. They're not even, they're not even getting off the chair. They're just straightening up in the chair, right? Then they're just pressing their foot down and you shape it up. So you always think about where do you want to go? Where are you at now? That's your shaping plan. 
if that makes any sense, right? Thank you. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Yep. Um, yeah, the participant says that it's a great place to start. Um, just amazing, so much info in such a short time. Thanks for including the video examples. Um, I know you're going over. One last, uh, one last thing because it just came up. <laughs> we use something called the balance sheet for toileting skills. Uh, it'll be in the video now, but this was uh, developed by Eric Houghton, uh, uh, re um, redone by Elizabeth Houghton. But anyways, if I'm looking at something like wiping bottom, and I have my foundation skills that we just kind of all got from the presentation. You kind of think about, you could just do these things yourself and just list down what are those tool skills, right? That go into these things. Then you write down the tool skills. You see how fast you can do them or what's capable for you, not as fast as you can go, but what's a presumable rate. Then you assess your learner and now you have your plan for working. So like shoulder extension is over aim. You don't need to work on it with this learner. Elbow flexion is at aim. Wrist flexion is below aim. So you'd work on that, right? So this can give you like a head start into thinking about how you would create uh, a program for a learner, kind of what we're talking about there. So, whoops. Okay. The last keyword is amazing. The last keyword is amazing just to describe in a nutshell uh, Jonathan's presentation. As you can see, he's extremely knowledgeable. I strongly recommend you get in touch. Uh, he's definitely someone I would love to work for. Uh, he's also a very kind person if, you, if you've interacted with him. So um, that's a bonus as always. Jonathan, thanks as always. Yeah. And thanks. we're looking forward to another session, perhaps focused on more on oral motor, if that would yeah. be something you would be interested in delivering. Um, sure. Guys, email me the three keywords. Um, my email, I'll pop it, pop it again in the chat. Your full name as you want it on the certificate and your BCBA number. If you are not BCBAs, that's fine. Just put CPD on the subject of the email and I will prepare a certificate for you. We've got a lot of people who are going crazy about oral motor, just so you know. So. Yeah, I've put you on the spot. I know. I apologize, but I know you can handle it. That's why. Yeah, that's um, fine. So, guys, we'll uh, be back uh, in January, and I will keep you updated about the content of the next journal club. And if you've got any follow-up questions, you can feel free to pop your questions on an email to Jonathan. Jonathan, have a great Christmas break. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Take care. All right. Cheers. Thank you, everybody.